professor of sociology at UCLA. And it's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you today a living legend. Of course, I'm talking about Professor Kenny Burrell. Um, today, we had the treat of hearing from Professor Burrell a life in music and education. We have an audiovisual glitch here, huh? There we go. All right. So, Kenny Burrell. A life in music and education. Grammy Award winner King Burrell is one of the most respected jazz artists in the world. He has been active from 1956 to the present as a guitarist and a composer in a variety of musical contexts including solo, small combo, large ensemble, and symphony orchestra. He has performed and recorded with many of the most influential musicians in the world in jazz history, including Duke Ellington, Herbie Hancock, Dizzy Gillespie, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, Charlie Parker, Tony Bennett, Billie Holiday, Quincy Jones, Nat King Cole, Ray Charles, Louis Armstrong, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, Professor Burrell has over 100 albums, and he's appeared on God knows how many, but I guess he'll talk to you about that today when he uh, goes through his, uh, his life and history in this, in this musical genre. Professor Burrell is a recognized authority on the music of Duke Ellington in 1978. Uh, he was brought here by Claudia Mitchell Kernan. Um, he developed the first regular college course on Ellington ever taught in the United States here at UCLA. I'm proud to say that Kenny Burrell is an avid supporter of the Bunch Center. He has been for years and years and years. For example, longtime supporters of the center will finally remember his rousing Kaz Jazz at the Bakery fundraiser for the center throughout the mid-1990s and early 2000s. In 2003, to celebrate his spectacular career and contributions to African American Music Scholarship, the Bunch Center established the King Burrell Archive of African American Music in his name. And you'll see the, the logo for the archive over here on the wall. This living collection is dedicated to the role that Los Angeles social history has played in the artistic expression of musicians across the spectrum of musical genres that define the African American music tradition. In 2004, his Ralph J. Bunch Suite premiered at UCLA Schoenberg Hall. The piece, commissioned by the Bunch Center, is dedicated to the memory and the legacy of Ralph Bunch himself. It was during the centenary of his, of his birth, or directly following that year, actually. In 2005, Kim Burrell was named 2005 Jazz Master by the National Endowment for the Arts. He also received the 2004 Jazz Educator of the Year Award from Downbeat Magazine for academic achievement and excellence in jazz education. The founder of the Jazz Heritage Foundation and the Friends of Jazz at UCLA, Professor Burrell is recognized as an international ambassador for jazz and his promotion as an art form. I give you Kenny Burrell. Good afternoon. I'm so glad to be here with all of you. I see some very good friends, some colleagues, um, students, and um, others that I don't recognize, but the point is um, I know that we all share um, very common concerns and some very common goals. And Dr. Hunt has laid out very well some of the things that I have accomplished and I really appreciate that. What he didn't add in terms of the um, Kenny Burrell archive of African American music was that it was his idea to have a Kenny Burrell archive at UCLA. So thank you, Donnell. <laughs> it also says that Donnell Hunt, Dr. Donnell Hunt, is a jazz fan, as I found out recently, our president 
of the United States is a big jazz fan. Um, jazz, as most of you probably know, is probably the purest expression, musically speaking, the essence of what this country is all about. Because it embodies all of the elements that come together in our culture as a society, as a culture. And all of those musical elements can be found in jazz. Besides the elements, there is that deep spiritual content which is allowed to be expressed because one of the ideas about jazz and other forms of African-American music is freedom. You are free to express yourself in whatever you're feeling or thinking about and that gives you a wonderful license. At the same time, it also reveals a lot about you, about your personality, also about your knowledge. But it's there. Then the other thing about it, which is so wonderful, and it connects with the second thing I just said, has to do with the idea of improvisation. Again, you can do what you want to do. There's no rules. There are formats that you should follow. Uh, you don't have to, but if you break it, that's just revealing who you are. If you want to break the, break, the, break the mold, that's up to you. But the point is, this is a wonderful music which has spread around the world. And um, it is so powerful. And I'm so um, glad and proud to be a part of it. I have been a part of it now since, I'm an active a, a part of it since the late 40s, which is 60 years or so. And, um, but it's all been a great, a great journey. And I have been in it long enough to see it go from a folk art, a popular art, and rise to a fine art, which is equal to any music ever created on this earth in history. Jazz is a highly developed art form that will in terms of its content is worthy of the same level of attention and respect as any music from any genre, from any style, from any culture. Not just European classical music, but Indian classical music, Chinese music, all of the world. And I'm proud, again, to have the opportunity to be a teacher here at this major university uh, to add my part to continue the education of this music, to continue to educate young people to go on and become great musicians, um, also to help educate and create more public awareness, more audience for the music, and also to try to provide employment opportunities, opportunities that will give the young musicians, whether they're at UCLA or USC or, or Cal Arts or not even in college, but who have real talent, provide an opportunity for them to 
be more respected and get more work and therefore in an environment, create an environment where they can blossom as creative artists. Right now, it is not the greatest of times for the creative environment outside of school. There's very little steady employment for jazz musicians. And this is not a new story. This is an old story. And uh, that's one of the things that's part of my mission and the mission of others who are in my position to try to help uh, solve that problem. As Dr. Hunt said, I've had a very great career and I have to say it has been great with all the great people I've played with and all the awards and everything I've won and, and here I am at UCLA as this distinguished tenured professor and doing the thing I love and making money and so forth. That, oh, that's great. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm very fortunate, but there are thousands and thousands of talented musicians who have not had this opportunity or anything near it. And um, I know they're talented because I know that I, one thing I do know is about this music. So I um, uh, just wanted to kind of lay that out to you in terms of, if I, if I have, and uh, the importance of this music. And as I, Dr. Hunt and I were discussing in our initial or original conversations about the archive, and it's become one of my phrases that they kind of tease me about, but I believe it's true, that it's all connected. There's so many genres of African American music, and it's all connected. If you think of it in terms of starting at some point with slavery, I guess that would be the best point about African American music in this country, correct? That's where it started. So it started there, and it grew like a diamond, reverse diamond, and all of these genres popped up. So we're going to feel hollers, we have the blues, we have the spirituals, and from there, all of these things that we know about today have grown. All right, we're talking about blues, we're talking about hip hop, we're talking about rock and roll, we're talking about rhythm and blues, we're talking about all kinds of pop music and jazz. Well, hey, it's all connected. It's all connected to that same root. And that tree, if you will, has been the most influential element of the sound of American music. And it is recognized as such worldwide. And one of the creative geniuses to understand this early on and to codify and to preserve and to promote and to put into motion was Duke Ellington because he understood all of these things about this music. And he made a lifelong commitment to express through his music and his musicians who worked with him, such as Billy Strayhorn and Johnny Hodge and all those people. Um, an ongoing series of musical material that would express all of these wonderful elements that are contained not only in jazz but in African American music and that is why worldwide as we hear today on November 10th, 
2011. Duke Ellington, Edward Kennedy Ellington, is considered the greatest musical contributor of the 20th century, regardless of category. And this is not just my opinion, it's not just America's opinion, this is the opinion of the world, and this consensus continues to grow. Professors here at UCLA and others all around say that Ellington was the greatest composer America ever produced. Now, I'm not going to give a lecture on why that is. That's in that class that I teach here called Ellingtonia. But I, I'm, I'm just making a statement, throwing it at you to think about why is that so? You can take that, but it is so. And the greatest experts uh, of music around the world, and I'm saying including some of our renowned professors right here at UCLA, feel that way. So I just wanted to mention that because uh, in terms of what I am, and we all stand on shoulders. <laughs> Every one of us stands on some pretty good shoulders. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing what we do. And those are some shoulders that I stand on. I certainly stand on others, you know, such as Ralph Bunch, as we mentioned, and others. We all, we all have many shoulders that we stand on. But that's one of the main pair of shoulders I stand on. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll pause for a minute. Donnell, looks like sure. he wants to say you know, something. I neglected to mention at the outset that we're celebrating something today as well. <laughs> this whole year, we're celebrating the 80th birthday of Professor Burrell. So, a round of applause for that. <laughs> so, what I thought we would do, um, if it's okay with you, um, Kenny, um, you know, now that we have sort of an introduction to kind of, you know, your, your, your overarching philosophy as it relates to African American music and to jazz in particular, um, I thought it might be nice for the audience to have a chance to kind of engage with you and to interact, to maybe pose some questions, to get a dialogue going. Is that is that something that that, that works for you? okay with me? Yeah, that, that, that way we can have <laughs> we can have a give and take, a, a back and forth. Because I'm sure you guys are are burning to ask questions about this illustrious career, the, the, these important contributions. So, with that, why not just immediately um, go out to the audience for a question? Do we have a question back here in the back? Yeah, Professor Burrell. First of all, after ADF, congratulations you. on your unbelievable career. Could you talk a little bit about? Time management. I think that's interesting for colleagues, but also for students. Uh, you run a, a jazz program at the university. You are at over 100 records, and you also keep an active performance schedule. How do you manage your time? How do you determine to say yes or to say no? I always find it difficult to say no to a gig because I feel I'm a working musician. I better say yes. Who knows when I'll work again? But I would love to hear your take on this. Well, yeah, I, I, I understand, and it is difficult. I remember I had to say no to two people that I, oh, so sorry I had to say no to, but I had other professional commitments. One was Duke Ellington. He asked me to come and do a recording with his band when they did the, the masterpiece and the album called My People. I had to turn it down because um, I had some other commitments. Now, I didn't have to turn it down, but at that point, I was uh, very busy as a first call studio musician in New York, and I uh, had some engagement that they were kind of counting on me, and so I chose to do that. But later on, um, because my head and my heart were in the right place. Duke Ellington and I became friends, and he has listed me in more than one occasion as his favorite guitarist. And I did get a, have a chance to uh, perform with him, actually, uh, on a television show. At least I did it once, and, and so, 
And the other one was Miles Davis when he first started to use guitar. I had to, I had some other commitment. Um, I think that one of the things you said in your question, you used the word afraid. And um, we all go through these phases about being afraid to say no. Um, I think when you're young, that that's very understandable. And I think when we get a little older, and you are now a tenured professor, so um, I found that if I have, uh, when someone asks, and, and I, I really um, am overly busy, I just explain to them pretty much the truth about I've got all of these things on my agenda, and I don't think I can fit it in, not only from the standpoint of time, but from the standpoint of deadlines that I have to meet for these other things that are really high priorities. So I just say, uh, if you're interested, we'll do it down the line or another time, but we, I can't do it now. And so that's a no, but it's not a shutting the door, you know, it's just a, <laughs> Hey, but I think your, your, the main thrust of your question was about students, how students can manage their time. Well, students need to, need to just deal with it and, and they can't get a lot of sleep. And, and if they're gonna be really busy, you're gonna miss a lot of sleep. But when you're young, you can afford to do that. You know, you can, you can stay up for days and all that stuff. And, <laughs> and when you get older, you can't do that. So, uh, but um, that's the thing. Uh, but how, however, well, however age you are, whatever age you are, um, I have to bring in, since I'm the subject here, I have to bring in the other thing that I tell my students, which not only applies to them while they're students, but applies to them through life. Whatever you're doing, the key is consistency. Well, we're assuming you're going to be great. Okay, you're gonna, we're going to reach your high, high, height of your whatever you're going to be into. But you can't be great this week and not so good next week and then messing around and then great six months later. You're not going to get a reputation or a good job with that. Consistency is the key. And sometimes that takes a lot of work, missing a lot of sleep, missing food or whatever, uh, something that you want to enjoy. It's a sacrifice you have to make to be consistent. But it pays off. It does pay off. You may get a little, few more wrinkles, and more gray hair, but if, the point is it pays off. Uh, and uh, that's all I can say about that. Yeah. Questions? Yes, I hear. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Burrell, thanks so much for uh, speaking with us. Um, my question is related to I guess our approach to our history. A lot of historians, a lot of times now, they're trying to tie our history into an existence before slavery. If you were going to look at jazz, is there any way to tie that into something that existed before slavery? Well, yes, it, but jazz was created here as a result of slavery. The musical elements are from Africa, mainly, you know, from Africa and Europe. That was their main musical elements in the beginning because you had, obviously, African slaves come here from Africa and you had a culture here that was already here. I'm not, I'm not talking about the Native Americans, the, the people who came here, the pilgrims, et cetera. That, that's European. So those two elements were the things that formed the ele musical elements of jazz and other forms of African American music. So I'm not, maybe I'm not answering your question, but I don't, I guess I am answering your question. Jazz started with slavery. But that, that answers the question again. I guess, you know, sometimes you see these articles and they'll say, well, jazz is 50% African, 50% European. And it's like, well, why do you say that? What's the Oh, that's tie another in? question. That's another question. It's kind of like, what's the beginnings that even make that? You know, what's those elements? Okay, I can address that question. I wouldn't put a number on it, like 50% here or there. Oh. But that, that brings up a um, interesting question, 
which I think would be worthy to talk about for a second. I see some of my students here that have taken my class. And, um, first of all, when African slaves came here, they didn't leave the music at home. The music was here. The music came with them. However, in the United States, they were not allowed to perform their music and celebrate in, in, in a manner in which they had done in their home country. So the African drum was not allowed. There was no such thing as using the African drum. None of that. That was because of the, they were afraid of rebellion. You, know, you don't want these blacks to get too carried away with these drums and you know all of a sudden we got a rebellion on our hands. Okay. So, but every now and then there was this thing called Congo Square, you know, and so they were allowed to do that once in a while in Congo Square. That's the only thing. However, this didn't happen in the Caribbean. They, the drums were there. So that's why we got this Caribbean music from Cuba and all the different places. Um, okay, and then I'll give you a little picture. In Africa, as we all know, one of the main things is the drum, the drum, various kinds of drums. Now this, in Africa, as we, as you listen to a symphony orchestra or a big band, a big band, you can hear, big, everybody knows what a big band is, right, with all these saxophones. And, okay, there's, it's sitting in front of a big band, there's a saxophone section, you got five saxophones up there. Or in the back in the back you got a trumpet section. Well that kind of grouping in Africa, they had the percussion section. That was part of their culture. You know, a, a drum a group, if you will. Okay. That's just part of the culture. Now that wasn't left at home in terms of the musical psyche or memory. That was just not allowed. Okay? okay. So that's one thing. The other thing, <clears throat> which I will come back to, but I will just make a point of it right now, is the singing and the melodic aspects of the singing. The timbre, the sound, the intervals, the note intervals, all that stuff. Truly important, something we don't talk about, but I'm glad today I'm able to talk about it. Um, then they came to a culture where they were not allowed uh, benefits at all, treated as subhuman, you know, staying in certain quarters. But listening to sounds that were European, which had beautiful harmony, melody, rhythm wasn't so great, but it was, you know, the point was. <laughs> the, you know, the emphasis, to put it this way, the emphasis in Africa was on rhythm. The emphasis in Europe and that that area of the world was melody and harmony. I'm not saying what, I didn't mean, I'm, I'm not trying to put it down, but it wasn't, comparatively speaking, it wasn't as great. Uh, African, uh, the rhythms of Africa are so complicated and unique and, and highly developed, it's incredible. It's very much like much of the uh, development in, in European classical music in, in terms of melodic aspect and harmony. Okay. So those two things combined. Uh, however, that's what happened. The black American was trying to adjust to this society that he was forced to live in and one of the expressions, one of the things that is a big everyday part of African culture is music. Music for all kinds of occasions. Okay? So, you know, the, the spirituals came up, the, the working in the cotton field, the field hollers, all that stuff. And then the blues. Okay.
one of the things that is not talked about that is unique to African music that has become unique to American music and now unique spread throughout the world is something I choose to call microtonality. Okay? Now, you may not have heard that word before. However, you know what micro means. So, we have our normal scale when you see a piano, da 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 da. That's the diatonic scale, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. We hear that all the time from kids on. But here's, again, I'm not going to give a lecture, but I have to explain a little bit here. In between each one of those notes, there's some other notes. There's some other notes in between. If you think about the piano, just stay in between a white key and another white key, there's some notes there that you can't play on the piano. You can't play them. Or in between the white key and the black key, you can't play them. These are microtones. Okay. Now, that microtonality came from Africa. Started with the spiritual, started with the field hollers, started with the blues in this country. It was the sound of black music, okay? It is the sound of black music. Now, it is a major sound of American music. This is something you can't even, you can write it down. Nobody's even bothered to do it. That's a whole other subject of why they don't want to write this stuff down. The point is, um, it is the essence of the sound that gives America that certain sound that comes from African Americans. That's influenced every kind of music this country has produced, including classical. Now it's around the world. You can think of any singer you know about, any instrumentalist you know about, they use these notes. We never even talk about that. We just say, oh, he's great, oh, that's great rhythm, that's great huh? We never even talk about this thing. But it's there. It is the unique thing, one of the unique things that makes jazz and other, other forms of American music, regardless of what it is, so unique. So that's a long answer to answer your question, but I am glad you asked the question because this is something that we need to, to acknowledge and be aware of, that this was a musical uh, element, a musical um, um, outpouring, that's not the right word either, but uh, part of, it, just put it this way, it was part of the music that came from Africa, besides the rhythm. It was a strongly important part, and you can hear that now. This goes back to your question. You can hear those microtones if you listen to the people in Africa sing, and you hear the instruments play the thumb piano and all that other stuff. That's not do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, okay? That's not the European diatonic scale, the well-tempered clavis well-tempered scale. That is not that. But that was brought here and that's what gives it to you, Nicholas. Yes, right here. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about working with uh, with the Gil Evans and the guitar farm album. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was nice. incredible. You hear the story behind that a little bit. That was incredible. Uh, Gil Evans was one of the great arrangers in jazz and some of you might have remember his name or, or uh, I'll make the con can make the connection between the albums he did with Miles Davis called Sketches of Spain, <coughs> Miles Ahead, etc. And uh, at one point the president of CTI Records asked me to do a record displaying all of the different things that I could do with the guitar or because I had been um, as I mentioned earlier, the first call guitarist in New York. And one of the reasons I was first called, because I like, a little, I like a lot of different kinds of music. I really do. And so that means 
I enjoy playing a little rhythm country music. That means I practice really hard many hours a day to be able to play different kinds of music. And so when people recognize it, they say, well, yeah, I want you. So he recognized it and he said, I'd like you to uh, make a, a record displaying all these different styles and sounds of the guitar. I said, yeah, I'd like to do that. And then we talked about who to get as an arranger. And I immediately said Gil Evans um, because I just love what he had done for Miles, Miles Davis. So that worked fine, and uh, there was there was no problem except, if not for me, there was a problem for the record company because Gil Evans was a person who took his time and was not to be budged. And they kept saying, "Well, what's wrong? And why is it so just so delayed?" I said, "He's working on it. Don't worry. When it's finished, you'll be happy." <laughs> you know, but. That's a business. They run on a budget. They run on a time schedule, and they have certain things. But, but I'm I'm very happy with the results of that of that record, uh, which I was able to play the uh, nylon uh, um, nylon uh, acoustic guitar and the electric guitar, and um, on that record it was classical music, jazz, blues, flamenco kind of. Uh, and, and a fusion of, of, of a few other things. So thank you for asking that. That was one of the albums. And that was the first time I was able to uh, get a Grammy nomination. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have to think it's, it's pretty obvious that it needs to be done. And uh, I'm, I'm doing some writing on it and encouraging other people to write on it. And what it amounts to is just giving credit what credit is due. Simply telling the truth. <laughs> That's all. Giving credit where it's due, telling the truth. And that brings me to, if you will, well, we got a few more minutes. I'll, 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 I'll got something else I want to talk about, but I'll get to that later. Um, um, but I'll hint on it. I'll just touch on it for a moment. Uh, and, and that's in terms of, uh, of our survival as a species. If we don't get to that truth pretty soon, I, I think we're, we're going to, we're already kind of going down. It's going to increase. It's going to get faster. So that's another story. And I'll make a few points about that before we end. Charles. <clears throat> Professor Burrell, first of all, it's a real pleasure to be here to listen to you talk. Thank you. Uh, UCLA is very fortunate and blessed to have you as a professor here. Uh, the question I have for you, though, um, given your background in Detroit growing up, uh, what was some of your early influences and how did you get started with this, this magic? I mean, what is it? That okay. You. Who are your inspirations? Right. Well, <clears throat> when I was a youngster in the 30s, <laughs> there was no such thing as jazz radio and pop radio. It was just radio. In fact, I remember I'm at the age now where Most of you, well, I'm going to say a word you've probably never heard of, something called a crystal set. Crystal set is a radio. <laughs> I remember when the radios first started. It was I was a little kid, but I remember my brother and my older brother and this crystal set. And, it, and, and the, you know, you heard all kinds of music. And when, I, when we listened to the radio, I heard... Uh, Ella Fitzgerald, Count Basie, Duke Ellen, Kate Smith, the Mills Brothers, Bing Crosby, 
all of it in the same station. Uh, it was, they were playing American music. And then eventually that was also a classical music station, which was playing mainly European music with the symphony orchestras and so forth. That was a little bit too high brow for the masses, but it had its own audience, so they started to have a classical music set. But other than all the other pop music was on one station. And then I remember uh, well, there was also a couple of broadcasts of, uh, of um, gospel, gospel organizations. Um, so I grew up with that. So in my mind, music, going back to what Duke Ellington says, there's only two kinds of music, good and the other kind. So if you heard it, you liked it, <laughs> cool. If you didn't like it, don't listen to it anymore. And you know what? Basically, we're, we're headed that way anyway. But the point is, um, that's how I grew up, that mindset, okay? Uh, my mother played, there was a piano in many families, not just African Americans, but in many families, the main instrument, the main entertainment in the house was a piano. We had a, kind of a raggedy upright piano, but it was, it was cool because that was before the record player. I remember my brother coming home, because he was the only one who was working at that time. He, he had a little job. He'd come home with a wind-up big troller. And we played these records. Wow. But before that, in the 20s and the 30s, and before that, you're entertaining people by playing the piano or the guitar or something. You know, and that was, so we had a piano. My mother played a little piano. She, like, pretty, she didn't study, but it was just in the house. My brother, he played, my oldest brother, Bill, he played the piano. Uh, but none of it was like, uh, how can I say, studied. It was just, they picked it up and played some nice thing. But for me, at five or six years old, I'm listening to this. It's cool, you know. As a matter of fact, I mentioned this the other day to somebody, and my first public appearance as a performer was at a, as a pianist. Um, just by, I picked up some stuff by ear, and, um, and, and when I was in grade school, they used to have something called auditorium, where maybe once a week everybody came into the auditorium and, and, and the kids who could play, who, who wanted to do something, would just perform. So I just got my nerve up. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into this. And, you know, you know, you kid, you want to show off a little bit. You know, so so <laughs> I played this one piece on the piano, and, and people seemed to like it. And I, That's cool with me. And then um, I took some piano lessons, but um, it didn't um, it didn't appeal to me <coughs> deeply, emotionally and spiritually. So I wasn't going to be a piano player. But uh, um, my brother Billy was uh, I mentioned him a few times already, but he's very important to me. Um, he started to play the guitar, and I think it's because my father. Not because of, but it was my father was a uh, mechanic, and he liked to just have fun singing and dancing and playing a little ukulele, and so that kind of it was that kind of atmosphere in the home. It was loving and musical with with uh, little piano and records and so forth, and radio. And uh, my brother got the music bug, and he started to play the guitar, and he became really good at it. And I was watching him when I was about six or seven, just checking, you know, how kids check stuff out. And I learned how to play a few little chords just by watching him, you know. And to me, that was no big thing, you know. And uh, as we know now, they don't even make a million dollars over three chords. <laughs> but, you know, so anyway, um, so that was the, um, my, my beginning. And then, I was going along and not uh, necessarily thinking about becoming a musician. And then when I got to be 12 years old, it hit me. That music bug, I really said, oh, I want to play music, I want to play music. And at that time, um, again, I was listening to the records and the radio, and I was fascinated with the tenor saxophone. Um, 
Coleman Hawkins, Lester Young, Schubert, they may know, probably don't know who he is, Schubert, but the tenor sax, you know, with the, that was a masculine, really beautiful instrument, which it still is, you know. But this was during World War II. Now, World War II, you know, that was um, metal, M-E-T-A-L, was very expensive and very scarce. And they, which means the saxophone was very expensive. We could not afford a saxophone. <laughs> And my father had died at, when I was six, so it was just my mother, and it's, that was out of the question. So I said, "Well, I gotta, get, you know, I just I'll get something." So I went to the uh, pawn shop, and a few blocks away, and I bought a guitar for ten bucks. This is old raggedy little guitar. I just wanted to play something, and um, uh, I started playing it. And uh, my brother was in the army at that time. And uh, um, but after I started playing in a little while, then I heard this is the answer to your question. <laughs> I heard um, Charlie Christian, who was the guitarist with Benny Goodman, African American, who was the first. He wasn't the first. He had he had a, a, a gentleman who influenced him, but he was just. Um, Eddie Durham was the, was the first electric guitarist. He played trombone, he's with a ranger, uh, and he kind of started Charlie Christian out. But Charlie Christian took the ball and ran with it, you know, and made all kinds of touchdowns with it, if you will. Um, and so the significance of Charlie Christian, which is how it affected me, you see, the guitar to me was just not so great because it was a background instrument. You just kind of accompany people. And I wanted to be one of those guys in the front line, with the trumpets and the saxophone. But when I heard Charlie Christie, he was playing the electric guitar, loud, like the horn, you know, and he was playing single lines like a horn, sounded like a saxophone or a trumpet. And I said, hey, the guitar is not so bad after all. <laughs> so I stuck with it because of that. And um, then I found, somehow found a little change. I, I won't tell you about all the lot of jobs I had, but that was, that's for another, another discussion. But, you know, I was hustling around as a kid, because we didn't have any money, so I was shining shoes and sweeping up barber shops, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, so I got some money and finally got an amplifier and I was pretty cool. And then the other two influences, strong influences, or three, were uh, about that time in 48, yeah, 47, 48, 45, or right in there. The Nat King Cole Trio. Behind the great Nat King Cole Trio was this guitarist named Oscar Moore. To me, he's the most unsung guitarist in the history of jazz because he brought to the limelight, to the forefront, these beautiful chords, these beautiful harmonies, these modern sounds on the guitar, which no one else had done. And they weren't, you didn't pay much attention to because he was just backing up Matt King Cole's beautiful voice. But he was the one who laid down for all of the guitars to follow him, including myself, these beautiful harmonies. And so the combination of Christian with his single line and Oscar Moore with his beautiful harmonies, that laid the groundwork for my, my, my music. And when I say he's the most unsung, but so all of the guitarists who came after him, you name a jazz guitarist, they have been influenced by both those people. And people talk about Charlie Christian, they don't talk much about Oscar Moore, that's what I mean. And, uh, and then there was um, the blues which was all around me. And I used to go to church on twice on Sunday with my mother, because the second, <laughs> second Baptist church, as the same church that well, Bunch went to when he was in, living in Detroit, uh, BYPU and all that stuff uh, it, on Sundays, so that was there, and then the blues was all around. Blues was everywhere. And the blues was just a natural part of the environment, part of the music. 
it wasn't something you learned, it's something that you are. If you if you if you know if you're African American or if that's you in that environment. And then there's one other guy I, I will mention that um, didn't have a direct musical influence on me as a guitarist, but he had a kind of a philosophical, uh, not funny what he said, but what he was doing. That was Django Reinhardt, the gypsy guitarist out of France. He had such a unique sound, different from anybody, with his just fast vibrato. I just marveled at uh, the sound, but we all respected him because he could play so great. And he, he, was, he was, you know, he was influenced by jazz, so he was trying to become a great jazz musician like the American jazz. But the point was he had an accident, so he could only play with two fingers on his left hand. And, um, uh, but it taught me, it sent home a message to me that on the same instrument, you can get your own sound. That's the first time I ever, that ever sunk into me. I mean, certainly now we all know that our, all of our favorite artists have their own sound. We know that. But I'm just telling you, that what hit me at around 12 or 13. And uh, beyond that, the major influences in terms of my music, besides Duke Ellington, uh, well, that's a whole nother subject, would be Charlie Christian, I mean Charlie Parker. <laughs> and the saxophones that I mentioned, Coleman Hawkins, Lexter Young, but Charlie Parker mainly, and Dizzy Gillespie, and, and, and to some a little lesser extent, Miles Davis, and uh, Coleman Hawkins, so forth like that. And, and I love piano, so all of the, all the jazz pianists. Yeah. Well, I'm going to apologize in advance because we have, I see lots of hands and little time, unfortunately, but you've been holding your hand up for a long time, so why don't you go ahead and okay. take the first one. First, I want to say um, happy birthday, <laughs> a.k.a. Solar Return. Um, I've been a jazz fan since high school days. We won't say how long ago right. that was. But I just wanted to, um, you know, we're living in a time when, when art and music education in the schools, especially for younger children, is being taken away. Um, and growing, growing up here in L.A., there were so many venues you could go to to hear jazz. Right. Um, can you kind of give us some direction or advice about, you know, what, what can us folks here in L.A. really do to advocate uh, for, you know, more so that we can hear the music? And we're, we're not hearing it on the radios. So, you know, can you kind of speak to that? That's a real dilemma. That is a real, real dilemma. I'm embarking on a project right now, which is going to take me a few minutes to explain, which um, I, I, I'll try. But um, the um, when when Ellington in the 20s, I'm going to put it this way, in the 20s, I was just thinking about what Ellington and, and those people who were into jazz and those, at those times. All the musicians in the 20s and up into the 30s, um, they used to give something called house rent parties. And they would just have musicians come over and play. Now, I also know that some of my well-to-do friends give salons, which is another <coughs> form of house party, and they have musicians come. So I'm just saying on a practical term, if you just want to have some fun, and you know, if some friend with a big house, have a party and, and, and then hire a trio or a, a group and have them have a jam session. You'll hear the music. This will give you some pleasure, your friends some pleasure, and it'll give the musicians a few bucks. You know, what's wrong with that? And uh, then you don't have to worry about um, uh, having to go to some club and pay a high, high, high price, and, and uh, many times they won't have who you want to hear anyway. <laughs> so you can hire who you want. The point is, I'm telling you, this 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 can work, and uh, the musicians will really be appreciated of that, because there is, if I may say this, <clears throat> and this is really a problem, really a problem. A friend of mine, and this is another thing I, I, I remember earlier. I asked you to think about the question of why Duke Ellington is considered the greatest jazz musician, of the, the greatest 
musical contributor of the 20th century, not just jazz. Here's another, here's another question for you to think about. Here's another statement for you to think about. A friend of mine came to me. We were, I was doing some work for ASCAP, which is the so American Association of Composers, Authors, and Publishers. And he was saying, Kenny, I really admire what you're doing at UCLA. You're really teaching these students, giving them some great training for jobs that don't exist. Think about that. And here's a clue. In the United States, there's only one jazz orchestra that works steady. One. We have a lot of cities in this country. Thousands and thousands and thousands of musicians, jazz musicians and pop musicians. That's the Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra. That's the only one. Okay, so I'm embarking on a, on, a, on a program with some people to try to do something like the Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra here and, and encourage other people to do it in their cities. That's not going to solve the problem. This is going to maybe help a little bit, like a Band-Aid on, on something. But um, what, is, what is not happening here is that you have the Los Angeles Philharmonic. You have the Los Angeles Opera Company. You have all kinds of established institutional ensembles that work steady, that have seasons, that have employment, that have medical, based on classical music. There's none for jazz and none for popular music. None, except that one I mentioned. Even, even the guys who used to do a lot of the studio work here in, in town, you know, for the Hollywood movies and television, they're hurting as well because of the digital age, the electronic, they can have one musician do a whole movie score with his computer. They don't need orchestras anymore. They're, they still do it. Like when you see the, the Emmys and, and the Oscars, you see a live orchestra. But that is way down. Now that's indicative of, of our culture, the, the, the economic problem in this country. That's indicative of that. Everybody is suffering. But the old story, this is not a new story, the old story is that this music, this music I'm talking about is a new, I'm talking about jazz now, is a new kind of classical music born in America. It's a new kind of classical music. Music for the 21st century has not been embraced this century or last century by the classical world, okay? Um, I'm going to continue to try and um, hopefully some of my students, other students, and other people will try to help solve that problem because as you know it's not fair. This is highly developed music. It's on par with any other music, yet it's kept outside. Okay, And now uh, you know what ramifications that has on creativity just on paying somebody's rent, on eating properly. There's a lot of problems there, you know. So um, that's one of the things. And I, do I have a minute or two more? Yeah, why don't you uh, give us some, uh, some parting uh, words of wisdom here. Okay, it's not, so. not words of wisdom. I just wanted to also, <laughs> also uh, and it's not words of wisdom, just to remind you of something that you already know, that we are blessed, all of us, with such capability, we, are, we amaze ourselves sometimes with the things that come to our brains, to our minds, because our imagination is unlimited. As Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. So if you can think, if you can imagine it, hey, you maybe find a way to do it. And we've done that when we write these papers or we give talks or whatever we do. All of a sudden, stuff starts to flow. You know? So we are blessed. We are blessed with 
uh, incredible capability. Um, also, I advanced said, we perfected our means, confused our goals. We don't know what to do as a species. We're on a downward path here. Um, and as Ellington said and others have said, we've tried everything, everything. But we haven't tried love. Okay. Love and respect. If we don't go down that road, we're going to be in much, much deeper trouble. And to me, that is the, not only the, the right road to go down, it's probably the only road we can take to get us through and reach our full potential as human beings. I'd like to thank you all for coming out, um, and I'd uh, like to encourage you to keep your eyes on your email and on our website for future events we have throughout the year. Um, it's been a pleasure. Yes? Do you want to make the announcement about Saturday? Um, yes. Um, well, why don't you give me the details? What, what's, what's the, uh, the time frame? Kenny's in concert. Right, right. <laughs> but, but if, yeah, what, Kenny's in concert on Saturday. You want to <laughs> give them the details about the concert? I will. Okay, great. I will. I'm so excited. Uh, that Saturday night at Royce Hall, they're going to have a um, big concert celebrating my 80th year, and uh, it's called Kenny Burrell, 80 Years Young. And I, I do feel young in the sense that I'm uh, uh, one of the main reasons I feel that way is because I'm so inspired by people like you and the students being here. Um, is always just uh, looking forward, not backward, looking forward, and it makes me feel good. On Saturday night, uh, my good friend, B.B. King is gonna be there with his whole band, and uh, um, some people may be surprised that B.B. King is Kenny Burrell's fan friend. Well, <laughs> let me just say this, there is uh, there's only two kinds of music. Hello? <laughs> and, uh, good and the other kind. <laughs> so, uh, when you get to be at a certain level in what you do, you go beyond the category. In fact, we're giving him an award, Charity. It's called the Duke Ellington Beyond Category Award. Why not? You go beyond that. Okay? The woman who is going to be our female star as a vocalist is Dee Dee Bridgewater, who is a friend, and she blessed me with recording a song that I wrote for Ella Fitzgerald called Dear Ella, which won a Grammy, so I'm very happy and proud of that. She's going to be there. Uh, I'm having a special um, tribute choir, which is going to be doing some of my music. Uh, I'm having uh, my, one of my favorite groups, the Jazz Urges All-Stars, is going to play, which is really our jazz faculty at UCLA. It's going to feature all of those people. That's the Jazz Urges All-Stars. It just so happens that it's our faculty, but it's just an indication of the greatness of the faculty we have here on our jazz program. Um, <clears throat> then we will have a big coming out party for this new orchestra that I'm starting, along with a couple of other people. Uh, it's called the Los Angeles Jazz Orchestra Unlimited. Now, I hope to do with this orchestra something like Lincoln Center has done. I hope that Los Angeles will embrace us so we can work and get the product so strong and powerful that we can have a season and we can have steady employment. Not only that, I hope it becomes a model for other cities. So this whole thing, thank you. So this whole thing can uh, uh, reverberate and become a vehicle that will provide employment, 
in a creative atmosphere for talented musicians. And then uh, I'm also honored to have the UCLA Philharmonia, which is the full symphony orchestra, doing some of my music. And the grand centerpiece for Saturday night is something put together um, by five of my friends and composers. They all contributed five minute sections to a suite of music, which involves the full symphony and the large jazz orchestra fused together as Ellington started. This was just a continuation of that imagination of that guy in the 50s. But this is a fusion of, of all kinds of musical elements, European, African, everything. Everything is involved here. And it's a suite of music dedicated to world peace. Dedicated to world peace. And so we're calling it Suite for Peace. And uh, it's going to be uh, really nice. Uh, John Clayton, Bill Banfield, Patrick Williams, Lou Matthews, Charlie Harrison, and I contributed something to it. So I hope you can come, and if you can't come, fortunately, KCET is recording it. And it will be shown during Black History Month in February. So if you can't make it, it'll be on television. So thank you. 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 Thank you.